Let's look at uh, what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 8 and 9. The Bible says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Father, I thank you for your goodness to us and pray, Lord, that you would bless our service this morning as we look into your word. And I pray that you would teach us through it, guide my thoughts and my words. And I pray by your Holy Spirit that you would convict us and guide us and comfort and help us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever got, had a song get stuck in your head that you just did not want to be there? Um, this happens a lot when you go into the store, right? Sometimes you go in the store and they're playing a song that, uh, that really you don't want. Um, when I was in, uh, I think, middle school or high school, I can't remember which, but the song Achy Breaky Heart came out. Remember the song Achy Breaky Heart? This is the, one of the worst songs ever written. And for some reason, uh, every DJ in the country thought that that was the best song ever written, and they played it constantly. Uh, it got to the point, you know, the bus that I rode to school, they would, pl- they would play the country music station on it um, as, as we rode to school. And inevitably, every, every trip there and every trip back, the song Achy Breaky Heart would come on. And after a little while, every time it came on, collectively, the entire bus would groan and yell, like, no, turn it off, it's horrible. And it would get stuck in your mind. Another one that I really hate, um, and I just hate this song, but it's a Christmas song, Paul McCartney's Simply Having a Wonderful Christmas Time. That's the, one of the worst songs ever written. Uh, there's absolutely no substance to it. And it, it really, it's just the same thing over and over and over again. And uh, if I go into a department store or something like that, uh, and I hear that song, I, I'm just having a bad time because I know I will be hearing that song long after that. It's an earworm. gets in there. Um, and you know, um, there's, there, <laughs> there can be a battle in your mind going on all the time, right? Uh, external factors can play a role in this. Hearing a song, uh, maybe something somebody says, uh, maybe a sight. Uh, but you know, there's a difference between a passing thought Uh, and meditations. Passing thoughts are not the same things as patterns of thinking. Uh, Some some, uh, thoughts you should not think might hit you out of nowhere, right? And and you don't even know where it came from, but that thought that came out of nowhere, it does not have to dominate your mind. Um, And it does not have to be your pattern of thinking. Charles Spurgeon illustrated illustrated this way. He said, we cannot help birds flying over our heads, but we can keep them from building a nest in our hair, right? Um, and it's not easy. It's not always easy. Just like it's not easy to get a really stupid Christmas song out of your, out of your mind, like all I want for Christmas is you. Don't get me started on that. Um, but you know what? God is interested in what you are thinking. Why is that? In, in what way is God interested in our thoughts? Well, the Christian faith is a thinking faith. It is not built just on mysticism and emotion, although there is emotion involved with the Christian faith. Uh, but God, is, God has given us a, a, a faith worth thinking about, and God is a person worth thinking about, and God is most definitely interested in what goes on in our minds. And this is a truth that is concerning. It, it would be terrifying for people to read my thoughts. If my thoughts were put up on the screen instead of Philippians 4, I think, I I don't think I would come to church. How about you, all right? If you walked into church and some technology was reading your mind and putting all of your thoughts on screen, that'd be a little intimidating, right? A little concerning because, because I don't want everybody to know everything that I'm thinking. Um, How much more intimidating is it then that God doesn't need technology, and he actually does see all of our thoughts. That's a little bit, that's a little bit concerning, right? 
But at the same time, this is also a comforting truth. Because it tells me that God is not aloof. He's not too busy for me, the individual. He's running the entire universe. And even earth is just a tiny speck in the grand scheme of how big the universe is. And, and then on the planet earth, I'm just a tiny speck on this planet. Yet God is not too busy for me in so much that he cares about everything, even what I think about. I'm glad that God cares so deeply for me. Even though it's a little intimidating that he knows my thoughts, I'm actually glad that he knows my thoughts and cares about that. So this is a little bit of a concerning truth, but it is also a comforting truth. And, and in his letter to the Philippians, Paul addressed several issues in that church. Most notoriously, he addressed, or most famously, not notoriously, but he addressed a quarrel between two ladies who were uh, prominent members there, Yodia and, and Syntyche. Um, and, and there Paul also instructed the believers of Philippi about their attitudes and their thoughts. So not, not just their behavior, although he does address that, but he talks about their attitudes and their thoughts. And Paul tied their attitudes and their thoughts to their behavior and to their actual stability as believers. Um, and we see that in, in chapter 4, verse 1. He says, Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Now that's at the beginning of chapter 4, where we just read about what we're supposed to meditate on, what we're supposed to think on. And these, these instructions that Paul gives concerning the quarrel uh, between two women um, and the need to rejoice in the Lord always and the forbid, forbidding of worry that he's going to forbid later on in the chapter, all these are part of standing fast in the Lord. They're all part of spiritual stability. And our text verse, Philippians 4, 8, is part of this instruction on spiritual stability. We are, if we are to be stable spiritually in the Lord, among other things, our thoughts play a major role in that matter. In, in what way is God then interested in our thoughts? Well, our text answers that question for us. Let's look at it again. Uh, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. What is God saying about our thoughts here? Well, I think there's a principle we can maybe take as a theme for this message, and that is this. God commands us to conform our thoughts to his character. God commands us to conform our thoughts to his character. Notice that last phrase of the verse, meditate on these things. That is a direct command. God is telling us what to think. He is telling us how to think. And so God is actually commanding our thoughts. And this is God's interest in our thinking. He expresses his will in a command for us to conform our thoughts to his character and his will. Um, what does the word meditate mean here in our text? It means to think about these things. Uh, um, meditate means more than just to keep stuff in mind. It means to take an account of it, to reflect upon, and then allow these things to shape your conduct. How should we understand this word meditate? Well, it concerns itself, this word concerns itself with patterns of thought. For example, um, we meditate about certain things just as a matter of normal patterns of life. We meditate about food sometimes. Uh, I know my wife does because she sits down with pen and paper and she thinks about what we're going to eat throughout the, the week, right? And then she, she kind of plans out those meals and then she has to think, what are we going to purchase at the store? And so on and so forth and asks me my opinion and I give it to her and then, and then she plans something else. But uh, anyway, <laughs> you can't have tacos five nights a week, I hear. Um, but uh, anyway, so you meditate about those things. You might meditate about vacation plans, right? You can't make plans without thinking about it in advance. I guess you can do that, but it's, it's going to be a better vacation if you plan it out. 
So we are to meditate on, so we, we do meditate on things. We, we, there are things we just think about and mull over in our minds. And we are to meditate on things that are true and honest and just and pure and lovely and of good report, or may, maybe we could put, uh, say, admirable. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so this word meditate is uh, given to us in the imperative mood. And that just means it's a command. You do this. It expresses a command to those of us who read it or hear it that we are to perform the action required. Um, Now, our text lists several things uh, upon which we are commanded to meditate, or maybe several types of things. We could put into this, call it categories. But there are things that are true and noble and just and pure and lovely of good report, things that are virtuous and things that are praiseworthy. Those are the things to meditate on. For sake of time, I'm not going to elaborate on each of these items in Paul's list. If you get a good, if you have a good study Bible, they'll probably have enough in there for you to, now you guys are all looking, don't, don't, don't read it now. Stop that. All right. Um, go through that later. All right. Uh, and uh, you can maybe find a good study Bible and that can kind of labor, elaborate on that list for you. Uh, but basically, I could sum it up and say that these are the things that accord with God's character, all right? God's will and God's character are true, and they're noble, and they're just, and pure, and lovely, and of good report. They're virtuous, and they're praiseworthy. Um, and all of those things are categories that, that conform to him. Uh, so these things are the, the fruit and the food of the mind that is guarded by the peace of God. And when you put these things, these good things into your mind, you mold those things over and they stay on your mind. Um, and then when, then, then you have the peace of God that he, that he promises. God commands us to think in a way that conforms to his character. And that, that type of a command that really appears throughout the Bible, it's not just here, uh, it's actually God is really con- concerned with our thinking. You go back to, and, and that appears throughout the Bible, you go back to Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet, hundreds of years before Christ came, he says to, the Holy Spirit says to, through, to his people through Isaiah, come now, let us, reason together, says the Lord. So God is calling on his people in that, posi- in that time to think with him, think through, uh, meditate on certain things. And he's actually going to talk about forgiveness and, and serving him. Um, Romans 12, too, very familiar to us. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we're called to be renewed in our mind and not conforming to this world, but conforming to God in our minds. Um, Ephesians 4.23, along the same line, says, uh, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Um, Psalm 19 and verse 14 says, uh, let the words of my mouth, this is a prayer from the psalmist, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. And uh, Jesus Christ, more than anyone, um, he aimed his instruction, much of his his instruction, right at our hearts, right at our minds, right at our thoughts. For instance, Jesus rebuked uh, men for hateful thoughts. He says, but I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Jesus rebuked sexually immoral thoughts. He said, but I say to you, Matthew 5, 28, but I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her heart. In fact, Jesus placed moral culpability not at the point of action, but at the point of thoughts in that regard. All right, um, and so he's he's concerned with our thinking. Jesus even rebu- rebuked worrisome thoughts, uh, just as Paul does in in Philippians, Matthew six twenty five. Therefore, I say, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? He goes on to say in verse thirty four. Therefore, about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own thing. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And see, Jesus is contrasting seeking first the kingdom of God and worrying about your stuff. 
And he's basically saying, don't worry about your stuff. If you're doing that, you're not going to be seeking the kingdom of God. Let God take care of you. Trust him. That's faith. Uh, so he is rebuking worry. Where does worry occur? In our minds, right? Philippians 4, 6, close to our text here, he says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Uh, and so... Um, <clears throat> We are not to, or I'm sorry, and so God is interested. This is God's interest in our thoughts, and it occurs throughout the Bible. God commands us, then, to conform our thoughts to his character. Now, how does this truth affect us? What should we do, what, what should we do about it? God commands our thoughts, and this command really implies several things, um, First of all, God's command implies responsibility rather than victimhood. We are not victims of our thoughts. Rather, we are responsible for them. If God commands our thoughts, then that means that we either obey or we disobey that command, and thus we are responsible, we are accountable to him for the way that we think. Now, you might understandably object to this, just like when you walk into the store and they're playing a song that's catchy and then all of a sudden, you know, you're thinking about that. Or it could be they're playing a song that is attached to a memory in your mind and then all of a sudden you're thinking about the thing that that, that memory that that song is attached to, right? Uh, so you might say, well, there are some outside reasons, maybe some physical reasons why we cannot be responsible for our thoughts but the Bible, and, and there are some physical influences, I will say that. There are physical influences on our thoughts. There are outside influences on our thoughts, and we can't really control all of those things. But the Bible describes and tells us that though we cannot control all of the things that would influence our thoughts, we are responsible for how, to, how we respond to those influences. Um, in fact, the Lord declares that Man is morally, morally responsible for his thoughts. I want to back up to something we looked at just a moment ago. Matthew 5, 28, Jesus says, But I say to you that whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Notice that Jesus holds the man in this situation responsible for his thoughts. Um, and uh, he can't really, he can't really um, control what women come across in, in daily life, what women come across as field of view. And in the day that Jesus lived, I'm not sure, uh, in the Roman Empire or in, or in Judea, not sure how ladies dressed. It was probably better than, than a lot of them do now. Um, but uh, men, we, we can't, we, we just, you just can't control that, right? You can't control that. But you can control your response. Uh, you can control how long you look or how you look. Um, and see, here's the issue. Men are naturally attracted to women, um, <clears throat> but if a man who sees a woman who is not his wife and he entertains sexual, lustful thoughts about her, about her in his mind, he doesn't do anything, he doesn't even say anything to her, but he thinks this way, Jesus holds him responsible at the point of thought. That's how God is... is, is um, interested in our thought lives. Now, this is natural. Men are naturally attracted to women. Sinful nature can easily take this attraction in the wrong direction. And so what is the world's solution for this? Well, the world's solution would be for men to just say that this is natural. I accept that. Um, and I can't help to think, but to think this, the way that I think. Um, and so I'm a victim of biology. I just can't help it. Um, in, in, and there's different ways that that has played out in society. Um, Ultra-religious men have blamed it all on the women. And so if the women would just walk around dressed more modestly, I wouldn't have a problem, right? And so you can see that in some cults. Uh, you see that especially in the cult of Islam where women are, in some expressions of it, women are, the only thing exposed is their eyes. Um, and I, I think that's really unfair to the poor women. Um, and, and then in some other cults, it's not quite as obvious, uh, although the Bible does teach that women should dress modestly, but 
uh, it, it, it's, it's ultimately up, uh, uh, up to, uh, or men are ultimately responsible for their thoughts. And so to say I'm a victim of biology, I can't help it, one way to deal with that is just to, to, to force all the women to, to dress in a burqa or something like that. Uh, that's the ultra-religious way. There's the irreligious way to deal with that too, and to say, well, I'm a victim of biology, I can't help it, so I'm just going to indulge. Uh, I'm just going to think how I want to think. Uh, and, and, um, and, and I'm not, you know, as long as I don't, uh, as long as I don't, uh, you know, hurt anybody, I'm just only, it's all in my mind, doesn't matter. Um, and, uh, and, and God's solution is not the world's solution. So you have like a religious worldly solution, you have an irreligious solution, and those kind of express themselves in opposite or seemingly opposite ways. Um, but they're actually expressing the same problem that men are sending in their minds. By the way, this works both ways. It's just because it's given in a masculine perspective doesn't mean that ladies are off the hook in this mind. But men are more prone to this type of sin, um, or at least this expression of it. Uh, so God's solution is radically different than that. He says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. He says, Jesus says in another place, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. And he doesn't mean literally. He just means, um, hey, if you can't handle this, don't go to the beach when it's crowded with naked women. Right? Um, and you know what? That's, that's what I have to do. I don't go to crowded beaches because I can't handle that. Or just just uh, uh, just got to know who you are and what you can handle, right? I, I just can't handle that. Um, and so the, the best thing for me to do is to understand that I'm 100% responsible for every thought that I think. And that really plays out throughout the Bible. God holds us responsible. So God commands us to conform our thoughts to his character. And that implies responsibility, not victimhood. Um, I see a second implica- implication here. And that is that God's command implies that action is required of us. God has commanded my mind's conformity to himself. And if he commands that, it stands to reason that he requires that I respond to that command positively. And our response to God's command must be a response of obedience. He doesn't give commands because he wants us to break them. Uh, God says something, so we must do it. And that's a bit of an oversimplification, but that, that is true. Um, so if we do not respond to God's command with obedience, then what are we doing? We are rebelling against God, right? There's no middle ground. There's no getting out of making a choice. Either you obey or you disobey. Either you set your course to, to follow the Lord on this or, or not. He requires us to act. And so when God gives a command, he does not present us with options. Um, and we, we, we shouldn't de- abuse God's grace. Some people say, well, God's given me grace, so I, you know, just do what I want. Uh, but what shall we say then? Shall we continue in, in sin that grace may abound? God, and certainly not. Or translated in the old King James, God forbid. How shall, we, who, how shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? So many people presume on the grace of God, and we can do that even in our thought life. And that is... Um, what does that mean to presume on the grace of God? It means that um, you're planning on asking forgiveness right after you, right after you commit this sin, right? I'll, I'll sin now. I'll ask forgiveness later. That's presumptuous sin. And that really, you know, God can forgive later, but that's really a, a bad attitude, a, a problematic attitude to have toward the Lord and toward his grace. So God commands us. He requires our obedience. And here God says, think this way. And we cannot say no. We cannot say no, I can't think that way. We're not to give up. Um, And so God's command uh, to conform our thoughts to his character really implies responsibility. It also requires, it implies action. One more implication here, and that is that God's command here implies that victory is possible. Victory in our thoughts is possible through our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, different people have different struggles in their thought life. Uh, some people might struggle with sexual lust. Others might struggle with, with envy. Others might struggle with hatred. 
Uh, others might struggle with doubt and fear, or as Philippians 4 talks about anxiety and worry. There, in a group of people, any, any number of people, there's going to be many different types of struggle, but all of, this, all of it's happening in the same location, and that is our minds. But the good news is that you do not have to live in perpetual defeat. You do not have to be dominated by some thought pattern that is sinful or, or something that God does not approve of. God would not give us the command without giving us the power for victory. And mastering our thoughts sometimes feels like mastering trigonometry, right? That has to happen in the mind. And, uh, and so we think it's too difficult and we can function at a certain level without it. Um, and, and that's probably true. Uh, I know it's true of trigonometry. I never mastered that, and uh, and so far I've never had to use that in life. Uh, but then again, there are certain uh, things that uh, you know I could not do because I have never done that, never mastered trigonometry. Um, and so, but God makes it possible for believers to have victory in our thought lives, for Christ or through Christ. Uh, Philippians four eight. We go back to our to our. Um, uh, text here. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, just, pure, lovely, good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. I want you to, again to think about this word. Notice this word, meditate. This command is given to us in the present tense. In other words, do it now. Continue doing it. Make these things your ever-present pattern of thought. And this helps us to get a picture of what victory in our thought life looks like. We, we gain the victory in our thoughts when the pattern of our thinking overall is in accordance with the character of Christ. When these things are really characteristic of how we think. That's, that's when we know that we're gaining the victory in our thought lives. Um, and I don't mean to say that victory is perfection. Just trying to help you see what it would look like to walk in victory. It doesn't mean you'll never sin. It doesn't mean that you'll never have a thought that you shouldn't have. Uh, that's unrealistic because we will not be perfect. We will not be free of living in, in, with a sin nature until we step on heaven's golden shore. Um, so victory is rather a pattern of thinking that, though not perfect, is in accordance with God's character, and God's character is really described by these, these things. So how does this work then? Um, how, do we, how do we have this victory that looks like this? Well, we must seek to take every thought captive to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I, I do see in the Bible five practical keys to victory in our thinking. And this is a victory that God wants for us and makes possible for us. And the first key is salvation. You cannot begin to think like God wants you to think until Jesus saves you. And apart from Jesus, we are sinners. We are enemies of God. And even we, we are that even in our minds. Uh, we're dead in sin and we need to be saved from sin when we're, when, when we're apart from God. Ephesians chapter 2 brings this out in verse 1. And, he, and, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, uh, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And so Paul is writing to believers here, uh, members of the church at Ephesus, people who had already been saved. And here Paul describes to them what happened. What happened when they were saved? What salvation is like? Salvation is what happens when God, by grace, takes, t takes sinners who are dead in sin and makes them alive in Christ. They were children of wrath. They were fully deserving the condemnation of God for their sin. Um, and, and, and then God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty for their 
cross. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Jesus died, was buried, and arose from the grave on the third day. And so this is what happens when God saves a sinner. He cleanses us from our sins. He forgives us. He transforms us from death in sin to life in Christ. And because of that transformation, the Holy Spirit coming to live within us, we have the ability to think as the Lord wants us to think. He sets us free from that. But, but how does this happen? Well, he goes on to say in verses 8 and 9, for, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Paul is writing again to people in Ephesus. They're already saved. And he recounts to them how that happened. Not only does he describe what happened, but how this happened, how a sinner is saved. They're saved by God's grace. They received that salvation, that grace, by faith in Jesus Christ. They believed that Jesus died for their sins, was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And they called on the name of the Lord for that salvation. That is, they prayed, they received Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they were were not saved by merit. He goes on to say, he emphasizes, not of works, Um, but they were saved as a result of God's grace, not their doing good works. God gave them eternal life. God gave them forgiveness of sins as they believed in Jesus and called on him for salvation. And without salvation, sinners are dead in sin, dead to God, dead dead to righteous thinking, fulfilling the unrighteous desires of the mind, following that pattern of thinking, thoroughly corrupt. This, then, we're delivered from And this is new life in Christ that awakens our thinking and transforms our minds. So the first key to victory, without this key, none of the others even matter. The first key is salvation. You must know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior and have the Holy Spirit living within you. Consider the second key, and that is this, prayer. The second key after salvation is prayer. We have victory, thought victory, by praying God's word over this matter in in our lives. Um, here are a couple of scriptures that you can pray well when, when, when thinking about your thought, because thought victory doesn't happen by accident. You need the power of God. You need to pray and ask the Lord to help you. Here's one prayer that I, I like to pray. This helps me a lot. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5 says, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. One prayer you can pray is, Lord, just God, just bring my thoughts into the captivity of Christ. Make my thoughts captive to Christ. Um, Psalm 19, verse 14 is a prayer you can pray directly out of Scripture. This is David praying to God. And he says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. He's concerned with what he's thinking. He wants God to, um, to see his thoughts and approve of them. And he wants his thoughts to be those types of thoughts. And so he's a good example for us. This happens by prayer. God, our thoughts can, can have victory as an answer to prayer. By, by God's power, after all, we can't do this on our own. And so we should pray this way, depending on the Lord to help us. And so the, the first and second keys to thought victory is first salvation and then prayer. Depending, all, You see how both of these are depending entirely on the Lord. The third th- key to thought victory is this repentance. Repentance. Now, what about the fact that we're not perfect? And there are times, you know, even though we want to think the right things and we, we want our thoughts to be patterned after God's will, there are just times that that's not happening. There's just times that you catch yourself. I know this from personal experience. There are times you just catch yourself thinking awful thoughts. Thoughts that if they were put up on screen here, we would never show our, fo- our, our, li- our, our faces in public again, right? And so the Christian life is a life that must in, involve repentance. Believers and unbelievers are different in many ways. Here's a major way. When believers sin, they repent. That's not just that they're sorry for their sin, but that they come to Christ uh, in repentance, sorry not just of the consequences of their sin, but of the fact that they sinned. And they want Christ to change their hearts. And so the Christian life is continual repentance. Here's a great verse to help us with this. My little children, 1 John 2, 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. That's the goal. We don't want to sin. But 
understanding that we're sinners, he continues to write, and if anyone sins, give an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. If you're a believer, Jesus is interceding for you at the right hand of the Father so that when you do sin, uh, you can go to the Father through him. You receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. God commands, or God's commands implies that uh, every believer has the power to think according to God's character and God's will. We have the power for victory over our sinful thoughts. Um, but it requires repentance. Paul would write in Romans 6, 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Under grace, we're not stoned for our thinking, but we are encouraged to repent and find grace to help in times of need. So the third key is um, repentance. The fourth key is vigilance. Vigilance. In other words, guard your heart, guard your mind, guard your thoughts. You do not become a holy thinker on, by accident. This requires purpose. Um, don't stuff your head full of garbage and you will not struggle with thinking about garbage as much. You will always struggle, struggle with thinking about garbage. Um, but the more that you put garbage in, the more difficult it is going to be. For instance, you know, on social media, you can stuff your head full of garbage. Uh, certain music can stuff your head full of garbage. Certain media, uh, movies, different forms of entertainment. There's lots of garbage in this world that wants to work its way in through your ears, through your eyes, uh, and pretty soon it just covers up your heart with, with thoughts we should not be thinking. So be on guard. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart or guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. So not only, we, not only are we to guard our hearts, but we're to do it with the attitude of diligence. Be vigilant. And be intentional, uh, intentional about what you put into your mind. Now consider the fifth key. Uh, let me just illustrate. Actually, we'll go back to this. To be intentional, uh, let's say it, this is the obvious one, but if you're, if you're a man that struggles with uh, sexual lust, well, if you watch movies that have sex scenes in them, you're going to really struggle with that more, right? And if you cut out all the entertainment that has that in it, you say, well, I tell you what, I don't watch the movies that show, like, everything. Ah, I mean, does it really need to show everything uh, to get the point across? Uh, so that is one way. Or if you struggle with, um, with hatred, if you watch movies that feature hatred or shows that feature, like, the drama and the hatred and the evil speaking and things like that, it's just going to rub off on you. Um, and so, uh, or listen to music that promotes that. Uh, and so uh, be vigilant. Guard your heart. Um, let's look at the fifth key to victory, all right? And that is delight. Your mind easily follows your heart. The fifth, the fifth key to thought victory is delight. In other words, love God's word and you will meditate on it. You will meditate on what is right. Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Look at that connection. Delights in God's law and meditates in God's law. Look at this blessed man. What is he like? He refuses the counsel and the direction of the ungodly. More than that, he delights in God's law, the word of God. How does this delight affect him? It affects, it affects his thinking. It affects his thoughts. God's law is constantly on the man's mind. Now, how does that work? Well, if you love something or someone, you will think about that thing or that person a lot, all the time. I'll give you an illustration. Uh, my wife and I, of course, got to celebrate our 20th anniversary. So we've been married for 20 years. And so I was unmarried for almost 25 years now married for 20 years. And I got to tell you the, the difference. I can remember those first 25 years. And the difference in my thinking is quite, quite um, stark. Before I was married, I thought of everything as an individual. Uh, when I would make decisions about what I buy, I considered me, right? And my thoughts and my desires. And, uh, and, and, and as a Christian, I did think about how that affected the Lord, you know, and, and so it wasn't just that. Um, but after getting married, I don't, purchase a cheeseburger without thinking about my wife. Like, like how is this going to affect the family budget? 
right? It's, and that's not a bad thing. I'm not like, oh, I can't get a cheeseburger. She's going to be mad at me. That's not what I'm thinking. But overall, I'm thinking I want our budget to be right because, first of all, I don't want to have to explain, uh, honey, I, I bought 15 cheeseburgers this week. Uh, and so now we're out. What is that? 15 cheeseburgers now. That's probably, what, $400? Uh, so, you know, I don't, I don't, I think differently. And it's not just practical stuff like that. It's colors. You know, I think of, I see a color. Oh, she likes that color. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that I'm always walking around, you know, saying her name under my breath or something like that. Uh, but it's like, hey, you know, I see something that I like. Oh, you know what? I don't think she would like that. Uh, or I think she would. Um, that's, that's because I love my wife, and she's constantly on my mind. Um, and by the way, that doesn't diminish after 20 years, uh, so praise the Lord for that. But if you love God, if you love Jesus Christ, he's always on your mind and in your thoughts. And when you buy something, you consider him. When, when, you, when you make decisions or when you enjoy the beauty of something, uh, even the turning of leaves in fall that's coming soon, <laughs> praise God. All right, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fall and cold weather lover. My wife is not. That's how we relate. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you can look at a tree. You know what's going on with those leaves? They're dying. It's amazing that God made dying leaves beautiful. Um, and, and you can just see those things and, and enjoy the creator uh, as, uh, through the creation. The psalmist said, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. And he said, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. Uh, and so his love for God and for God's word is affecting his thinking. And so victory, really, that key is delight. Delight in God, delight in God's law. Victory in our thoughts is possible, but only possible through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And this faith is grounded in obedience, for belief manifests itself in obedience. This is why Paul, when exhorting us to submit our thinking to God, as he's doing that, he, he, he exhorts us to act accordingly in the next verse. Thinking naturally moves on to doing. See what he says in verse 8, meditate on these things. Then verse 9, the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. So thinking leads to action. Um, and so let's wind this up. Uh, God commands us to conform our thoughts to his character. Meditate on these things, he says. This command implies responsibility on my behalf, not victimhood. This command implies action on my part, but also, and this is the most blessed part of it, this command implies that victory is possible through Jesus Christ. We can think as God wants us to think. But God is, and I doubt that this message is really going to help you get annoying songs out of your mind when you go into the store at Christmas time and they have no compassion. They, they're playing Mariah Carey or they're playing Paul McCartney and uh, they could do so much better, but they have not taken pity on you and now it's going through your head. Um, I don't know if this really, really affects that part of life. But God is interested in your thoughts, and he gives us victory in our thoughts through our Lord Jesus Christ.